Thanks. Uh, cool. So, uh, first of all, I'm super excited to be here. This is my favorite conference ever, uh, due in no small part to the fact that it's in Amsterdam. So, uh, I'm going to be talking today about some practical performance techniques that we can use in 2017 to get that native performance that we want and our users expect, uh, both in our mobile apps with PhoneGap Cordova, but also techniques we can use for web apps, progressive web apps, things like that. Uh, so yeah, so I'm one of the co-founders, co-creators of Ionic Framework. You can follow us on Twitter um, or follow me on Twitter at, at Max Lynch. I like to tweet a lot. So I think uh, it's really important that uh, this conference and other ones like it have a performance check-in every single year, um, especially recently now that uh, there's been so many new APIs released to help us build faster apps that if we're not kind of staying up on top of those things, uh, we're not using all the tools available to us to build the best apps that we can. And some of them are actually really, really simple to use, um, or they give us benefits on certain platforms like Android uh, that really need those extra uh, performance boosts, um, even if they don't work on iOS yet. Uh, and, and to kind of like reiterate why we need to kind of talk about this every year, um, I just want to like walk through a little bit of the timeline of mobile since 20, uh, 2007. So let's say PhoneGap kind of 2008, 2009 came on the scene. And this was really um, you know, a few years after the first iPhone ever, but pretty quickly after the first iPhone that lets you actually build third-party apps. Um, so you know, they've really been there since day one and have been a leader of this web mixed with native approach. Um, and it's a testament to this technique that not, they weren't the only ones doing this. Uh, so you had big companies like Facebook that were also using the native uh, <clears throat> HTML5 and native approach for their apps, and they were being relatively successful with it. But I think we all remember the great Facebook HTML5 debacle of 2012. Um, and if you were paying attention around that time, everyone was kind of like proclaiming the end of like phone gap and hybrid approaches and like no one was going to build those anymore and like it was just going to be the end. Uh, and unfortunately, I think a lot of people developed this opinion at the time that like phone gap and what they really meant was the mobile web view because phone gap's just as fast or as slow as the mobile web view. Uh, developed, like they developed this opinion that this approach was slow or not feasible for building great apps. And thankfully, like, that's not all our history. Otherwise, we probably wouldn't be here. Um, but I kind of consider this before 2012 to be the first generation of hybrid and mobile in general. Uh, because after this, the number of new APIs that we've seen to help us build faster apps have kind of proliferated and exploded. And it's kind of funny that like, Facebook didn't really have access to any of these, these features back then. So like, they were kind of limited by what they, they could do. But us in 2017, we're not limited. So we can really build fast apps that users love, that get lots of downloads and make lots of money using the stack that we love. Um, and on top of the new APIs, we also benefit from new browsers. Uh, one of the biggest improvements is the evergreen Chrome. Um, you know, It wasn't too long ago that we had to deal with the fragmentation and the old versions of Android browsers. So we don't really need to do it, deal with that anymore. Um, and then WK WebView, obviously, with an all-new JavaScript engine has really increased performance. And I think as a community, we're just starting to adopt, in particular, uh, WK WebView. We're hoping to make it a default in Ionic soon. So I think this is going to be a huge improvement. And just some context, we started working on Ionic uh, around that 2013 mark. So uh, I like to think we're part of the second generation, the second wave. And there's so much excitement, uh, exciting things happening. I'm, I feel really validated for focusing on this stack. You know, I, I remember talking to people earlier on that kind of were like, you know, are you, are you concerned that the vendors are never going to catch up? They're never going to help. You're kind of relying on Apple and Google and, and Microsoft, et cetera, to add new APIs. And like, I believed in it, and I think we all believed in it, and I think we've, we've been proven right that this is actually a stack that's been improving. So I want to talk about some tangible, uh, practical techniques we can use to build fast apps. Some of these, actually all of these we're using in Ionic today or in new versions of Ionic that have really, really made a huge difference. And as I was working on this, I realized I was kind of uh, 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 writing a lot of content that Paul Lewis wrote on this really great uh, rendering performance guide on the Google developer site. Uh, so I've got a link at the bottom and I've got a link to the slides later, but definitely check it out if you want to read more because there's tons of good information there. So to build fast apps, we really need to understand how everything got on the screen that we see. Um, so we need to understand the life cycle of a single frame and the pipeline to go from JavaScript all the way through to what we see on the screen. 
Uh, so you have JavaScript to create elements, move elements, uh, delete elements, et cetera. Uh, when that happens, there's a uh, restyling that, that takes place. You know, all our CSS is cascading, so all the styles need to be recomputed. Uh, the sizes of our elements and the layout in the page needs to be readjusted. Uh, and and in, by default, in the browser, certain child elements can actually influence parent elements. So you can have entire document reflows, if you're not careful, which kill performance. Uh, the browser then takes all the things on the screen and positions and tries to figure out what the, where the pixels will be filled in. That's the paint process. And then because we have multiple layers, like z-indexing or, or GPU layers, those all get composited down to what we see on the screen. And if we want to have the holy grail of 60 frames per second performance, which most people consider what they think is native, is when something is 60 FPS, uh, we have 16 milliseconds per frame to get through this life cycle. In reality, we have actually have a, a good amount less because the browser has overhead, um, in, especially on mobile. So we have about 10 milliseconds to get through this thing 60 times per second. Um, and that's really not enough time, frankly. So before 2012, we had, we had no choice. We had to go through this pipeline every single frame uh, for the most part. But now in 2013, there are all these ways to do less work or to skip big parts of the frame uh, that we just didn't have access to really before 2013. So using these techniques, I want to walk through some of them, we can get huge performance gains. And we really should be aware of them if we're going to build fast apps. So starting with JavaScript, by far the most important API that we have, and many of you are probably familiar with this one now because it's been around the longest, uh, request animation frame. So request animation frame basically queues up your function to be called through the next like refresh of the browser. So because most displays refresh like 60 times per second, uh, ideally this function will get called 60 times per second. Um, it'll be called less often if frames drop or uh, if it's throttled in the background. So it's a great way to save battery life during an animation if, you're, if your uh, tab is like backgrounded, because it won't get called 60 times per second. It'll get called only a few times. Uh, the really, really awesome thing uh, and huge implication here is that any animation work you do, any DOM modifications, you can actually combine them all for one single frame. Um, and that's one of the single biggest things that we need to have in our apps. Uh, and, and if we use this, we can, we can finally get smooth animations without jank even during gestures and dragging. So here's a simple example. Um, you call request animation frame like you would set timeout, except you don't provide like a timeout. Um, and the browser will call this, like I said, 60 times per second. So if you actually ran this code, uh, the x value keeps iterating infinitely. But the animation is nice and smooth, and you can actually see it because it's only being called so often. Um, unlike set timeout, which would just the browser would try to run it as quickly as it could, and it just wouldn't keep up. So this API is broadly available on iOS and Android, very safe to use today. And this is a big part of uh, one of the biggest performance killers, which is layout thrashing. So by default, if you read and write uh, to, to an element, the browser has to go through and actually draw all that stuff again, which is really slow. And if you keep doing it back and forth, you basically cause layout thrashing where, the, where this pipeline is just being like, it was holding up your UI thread, performance really drops to zero. So we want to avoid layout thrashing by batching up our DOM reads or measurements and our DOM writes or mutations. Uh, and one of, what, one of the ways that we can do this is through a technique called DOM batching. So we have a version of this in Ionic that has really, really helped us uh, both control our DOM modifications because it's hard to, if you're modifying the DOM or reading from it in random places, it's hard to kind of keep control of those. Uh, so forcing everything into a DOM batching technique has really helped us. And we were inspired by this project called Fast DOM. It's a small library. Um, if you're doing any DOM modifications at all, I think you should definitely take a look at this. And the way that, the way that it works is it provides, a, uh, it, it provides a measure and mutate function. In the measure function, you pass in all your DOM measurements, like you're going to read offset top. And then in the mutate, you pass in like DOM writes. And the output at the bottom, if you'll notice here, you've got your measurements batched together and your mutations back, batched together. So if you're doing a bunch of operations during an animation, those things will happen in order. It won't cause layout thrashing. And everything will be batched in one single reflow repaint. So if you're animating a lot of things all at once, this is huge implications. So here's an example of the naive approach at the top um, where you're not batching anything. Um, and if you're calling this a lot, the browser's just going to thrash. Um, but on the bottom, we're using the fast DOM technique. We're batching our measurements. We're batching our mutations. Those all get happened in one single frame, even if you have a lot of elements. 
So take a look at FastDOM. Um, go, to the, go to the GitHub page, check out the demo, uh, because you can compare side by side the force synchronous rending, rendering, which is the, the slow way, and then the batching technique, and it's just it's many times faster. It's pretty incredible. So we want to avoid la layout thrashing. That, that'll give us huge gains. The other one that I think hopefully is kind of becoming a standard in our toolbox is only modifying uh, 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 properties that uh, go directly to the compositing engine and skip the layout and paint. So the only two properties that we can modify if we want to skip those parts are transformations and opacity. So if you're dragging over a menu, like in Ionic you can drag a menu, that's just a transform translate X. Um, and there's maybe a little fade sometimes. Those things are really, really fast to animate. We can get 60 frames per second. If we were animating like the, the, the left property or margin left, we couldn't get that because those properties cause the layout and paint process to, to, to be rerun, which is not fast. So if we want fast animations, only modify those properties. Another feature we have relatively recently is this thing called passive event listeners. So by default, if you have a touch move or a touch start, uh, the browser try, kind of de-optimizes, thinking that uh, you might uh, stop scrolling. And so passive event listeners are a way to indicate to the browser that we're not going to hold up scrolling, so you can kind of let this thing run and be fast. And it's just a, it's a nice way to get fast animations during gestures. Uh, it's relatively new. The way you use it is you, you pass in passive true to your add event listener functions. Um, it's pretty simple to, to use. Uh, you just want to be careful, because if you actually do want to stop scrolling, uh, you don't want to use this. So this is available actually as of uh, iOS 10.2, so relatively recently, and it's available in the Android browser. So you should be able to, to get a lot of mileage out of that one. Uh, finally, the paint process is, is one of the most expensive uh, parts of the pipeline. And one way that we can kind of do less work here is using will change. So will change is kind of a nebulous new CSS property that tells the browser, kind of hints to the browser that we're going to be changing certain properties more than other ones. So if we're going to change scrolling or, or transformations or opacity, the browser can kind of help us by optimizing a little bit and, and just might make certain animations faster. So this one's a little bit weird to use because you don't actually know if it's doing anything. Um, so it's, it's kind of like you might just want to try it on something that's kind of slow and see, see if it helps it. You want to use it sparingly because uh, it's, it's going to increase CPU and, and memory usage. It's promoting uh, certain elements to their own layer. Uh, and they get handled differently. And they, they, it could relieve some pressure off the paint process, but if you use it on everything, then, it, then you have different problems. Um, and the documentation for will change on some of the sites says that you should try turning it on and off before animations uh, and see if that helps, because then you're only using it when you need it most. Uh, so a little example of kind of what you can use. Uh, you can indicate that you're going to change scroll position. Uh, you're going to change contents of something, transformation, opacity. You can pass in other properties to this. Uh, and this is kind of like the, the equivalent to the translate Z hack uh, that was kind of prevalent to force uh, the browser to treat something as its own layer. So we used that all the time in Ionic with scrolling because it was the only way to actually get it to be like GPU composited. Uh, so will change is kind of a way to avoid having to do that hack. Um, pretty available iOS since iOS 9.3 at least. Um, so you can use this one today. The one that I'm the most excited about gives us a way to skip three parts of the pipeline all at once. And this is CSS containment. So CSS containment helps us indicate that certain elements are isolated from the rest of the page, whether that's through paint, layout, size, or style. Um, and because paint and layout are some of the two most expensive parts of the pipeline, uh, being able to control that for once is a huge, huge advantage. Um, so here's an example of where we use it in Ionic. So we have a modal window that slides up from the bottom of a page. Uh, that needs to be smooth, it needs to be fast, um, and it's, it's never going to interact with anything above it, above itself. So we use contain strict down here. You'll notice Adam thinks it's an invalid property, but whatever. It's not invalid. Um, and so strict means that you're going you're gonna to contain size, layout, style, and paint to this element. Um, and on, on Paul Lewis's uh, page, he's got an example of where he, he did contain layout on an element, and it was 1,425 times faster uh, because it was basically not doing any, any work on, during the layout. Um, you can kind of see down there uh, the example on the left that takes 56 milliseconds to get through the layout part of the pipeline. Uh, the roots of that was the document. So it did a full document reflow 
even though you only modified something in a small box. Whereas on the right, uh, you had 0.04 milliseconds during the layout because it was just modifying the one single box. So being able to contain those operations is a huge advantage. So this is one where uh, <clears throat> it's relatively new. So it's not supported yet in iOS, but Android needs a little more help um, and can benefit from this a lot, and it already supports it. So it's something that won't cause you any problems if you use it, but do be careful using it because it actually has real implications. So if you contain paint and you need to influence, like you need to have a, something that shows over another element, like it won't, uh, or layout won't influence something else. So I think it's got foot gun potential, um, but if you, if you use it sparingly and you're careful, uh, I think it's probably one of the best APIs that we have, uh, and it's relatively new, which is exciting. So we're starting to see some really great tools. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't try to throw out a, uh, something positive about Ionic here. Um, so one of the reasons that you want to use frameworks like Onsen and Ionic, the Ember Cordova stuff we saw today, uh, frameworks try to do this stuff for you. So uh, one of the, I think one of the greatest benefits to some of the front-end frameworks like React and Angular um, were that you, you kind of were detached from the DOM, and you kind of got DOM batching for free because this virtual DOM concept like that's a big part of it. So uh, on the UI side, like we try to do a lot of this stuff for you. So we have components that are already optimized. They have the right properties. Uh, they're kind of pre-configured. Uh, we also have some APIs to help you do things like uh, we have the DOM batching thing, which is publicly available as an API. So if you want to do DOM writes and reads, we have some functions available for that. We also have some hooks into the scroll engine uh, because scroll handlers are also another way to cause performance problems. And we can help you skip that. Uh, and avoid some of the pitfalls. So uh, if you're not using a framework, which is totally cool, um, just make sure that you're using some of these techniques. Otherwise, you might run into performance problems. Uh, so there's a ton of additional APIs that we could use to kind of get performance in certain areas. Web workers is probably the most obvious one. If you're doing like a local CPU intensive operation uh, that doesn't have anything to do with the UI, uh, you can offload that to a web worker. It's like an, a separate thread. And Historically, web workers interacting back with the UI thread has been slow because you were just doing message passing. Uh, but there's an exciting new API out. I don't think it's really supported anywhere yet called Shared Array Buffer. Uh, and it's a way to uh, kind of communicate through a shared memory um, and uh, communicate back with the UI thread much more quickly. So I think we're going to start to see, once that's out, web workers working a lot better with frameworks like React and Angular. Uh, and that'll be really, really interesting. If you're building a PWA, you have different kinds of performance concerns to think about that are more in the caching realm of things. Um, so just keep in mind that there's a lot of topics there. Optimizing your CSS can actually be one of the biggest uh, sources of improvements. And you can help, you can debug your CSS performance in Chrome Debugger, for example. Uh, changing, uh, changing selectors and things like that can have a big impact. So don't discount optimizing your CSS because uh, writing CSS actually uh, has major consequences if you, depending on how you do it. Uh, debounting input handlers, if you're doing a touch move or a gesture, you want to just relieve some of the rendering pressure back to the browser by calling request animation frame. Uh, pretty much the first thing that you want to run inside of a touch handler. So uh, simple technique. Uh, bundle size concerns, so you should try to ship as much, as little code as possible to the client. Um, request idle callback is a new function that uh, lets you offload low priority tasks to when the browser is not doing any work. So if you have something that you need to run, but it's not as important as the UI thread, so like during an animation, request idle callback can help you do that and do it later. And you can actually have a little bit of control over knowing if it actually ran and forcing it to run if it doesn't run in a certain amount of time. Uh, there's WebGL, and then there's new JavaScript engine work. Uh, I think we have a lot of exciting things coming in the pipeline. Um, so yeah, so I just want to like kind of reiterate that uh, I feel incredibly excited about the future of web APIs. Uh, we're seeing with Ionic people building real apps that are doing real things that are uh, replacing native apps. And we're happy and excited that those, those companies are using Cordova and PhoneGap. I think, I think this technique has a lot of legs, and we're seeing some really great APIs. So uh, we should be nothing but super excited and pumped for the future of PhoneGap and Cordova, and hopefully things like Ionic. So uh, slides are online if you want to check them out. Um, Otherwise, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Great talk. A lot of awesome tips in there.